For almost a decade, Lawrence Jackson worked for the Associated Press as a photojournalist covering the George W. Bush presidency and happenings around D.C. When then-candidate Barack Obama won the presidential election in 2008, making history as the first African-American U.S. president, Jackson applied to become an official White House photographer within the historic administration. As a journalist, you want to cover news. You want to cover what's groundbreaking or what's important. And up until his election night in 2008, Barack Obama was making history. And then when he won the election, he was history. You know, he was, you know, the first African-American president. So any journalist, photographer, writer, or otherwise would want to be a part of that. And all of my buddies, when I told them I got the job as staff photographer for the White House, they were happy for me. They were like, I would apply for that job, or I did apply for that job, and I didn't get it. And I think they kind of realized, just like I did, that this was a historic opportunity. From 2009 to 2017, Jackson was part of a small team of official White House photographers and editors tasked with documenting the day-to-day of the Obama presidency. The team of staff journalists worked day and night, traveling within the U.S. and abroad with the president to capture all angles of the administration. Switching over from being a photojournalism to a documentary photographer, it wasn't that big of a switch in terms of how I approached my job, but in terms of just the exposure and how things were done, that was eye-opening because the first day at the White House, (laughs) I was given a staff pen, which to the Secret Service, that indicates to them that you're a staffer and you're not a threat, basically. And I'm walking to this event, and the Secret Service agent looks me up and down, and then he sees my pen, and then I just become invisible to him. And I walk in, and I start taking pictures of the event, and I just thought to myself, wow, that's how it's going to be from now on. They won't pay any attention to me now. Just take pictures and have free reign of the place. The access Jackson gained through his position had many benefits. He was essentially a fly on the wall, witnessing and documenting many of the stressful, intimate, and chaotic moments of the Obama presidency. Jackson's new book, Yes, We Did, Photos and Behind-the-Scenes Stories Celebrating Our First African-American President, highlights some of these special keepsakes cemented in time. Looking back on the job, Jackson says many of his days were spent photographing planned events and meetings. But some days, he also captured breaking news that interrupted the president's agenda. The president's and first lady's schedule is laid out sometimes months in advance, definitely weeks in advance. So on any given day, their schedule is laid out from the morning to the evening, almost to the minute. And as the photo staff, we meet in the morning and we figure out what we're going to cover, what they want covered, who's going to cover what. Like in my book where Dylan Roof was captured, that wasn't on the schedule. That disrupted the president's schedule. And I got to cover him as he getting briefed by his national security advisor. And then he was crafting a response with his speechwriter, Cody Keenan. And then he went to the lower press briefing office and he gave a statement to the press. That was not expected for the day, but that's what happens when things come up unexpected. And that happened quite a bit because news is always breaking over this or that or some geopolitical thing. Being a White House photographer means you're in constant close proximity to the president and his administration. Jackson says one of his favorite photos at the White House was taken in the Rose Garden from above as President Obama is walking through. I was able to do that because I knew the president was going to walk through the Rose Garden at that point. So in terms of the White House itself, it is a living, breathing museum. It really is. There's so much history in those walls. But that shot, I think, it was a beautiful day. I think it was in the spring. And the dogwoods had just blossomed, and they were on the ground, and the president's walking through. I think he's whistling. And it just is a really nice moment, a nice light. And it's a double-truck spread in the book. Despite the lighthearted nature of the president visible in some photos, Jackson says that some days it felt like he was on the outs with the commander-in-chief, but quickly learned that wasn't the case, and to not take it too personally. It's so funny. I used to talk to certain staffers, and they all felt the same way. They all felt like the president was upset with them about something because he wasn't smiling or he wasn't engaging in a certain way at certain times during the day. And you realize that he's got a lot on his mind. And in the book, I write about how his job is to be 
focused on everything that's in front of him. And sometimes he's got a plate that's full and he just can't smile when he's not ready to smile or he can't fake it. And it's something that I had to kind of realize, you know, over time that, oh, it's not about me. I'm not even on his radar. He's worried about the oil spill in the Gulf or the Ebola virus in Africa. Whatever it is, his plate was full. And the last thing that he was worried about was me. The presidency is a stressful job quite possibly the most stressful position in the world during some instances. But Jackson says to counter these chaotic times, most presidents find time to let loose and have some fun. There's this picture of the uh, first lady gently smacking the president on the face, and he's got a big grin on it. And off to the left, there's a a Secret Service agent. who was It was his going away party. So in that photo, if you can imagine, the first lady is talking to a group of staffers, And behind her, unbeknownst to her, is the president standing there listening to her talk. So she's talking for about three to four minutes, and nobody lets her in on the fact that he's behind her. So after she realizes, everyone laughs, and he comes up behind her and gives her a kiss, and she kind of smacks him on the face. And that moment was was just a really sweet and indicative moment of kind of their relationship and how playful they were or are with each other. And it's in a book, and it's one of my favorite photos. As the Obama era came to a close at the start of 2017, as President Trump prepared to take office, Jackson says there was a nostalgic feeling in the air amongst the administration. It was the end of a notable chapter in time, where many had worked so closely to the Obama family. In terms of just like the nostalgia, it was very, I don't want to say sad, it was just the end of an eight-year run that was really special, and I think... The president and the first lady said it best, you know, when they gave the going away speech in Chicago and they appreciated, they tried to thank all the staffers and and their family members because they knew the sacrifices that not just the staffer makes, but the entire family makes in, in doing this job. To find out more about Lawrence Jackson and his new book, Yes, We Did, photos and behind the scenes stories celebrating our first African American president, check out viewpointsradio.org. This segment is written and produced by Amira Zaveri. Studio production by Jason Dickey. I'm Marty Peterson. Viewpoints returns in just a moment. About 27 million people in the United States have chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, or COPD. COPD is treatable, yet half of flare-ups are never reported to physicians, suggesting that patients are not seeking appropriate care. There are 1.2 million COPD hospital admissions each year, and one in four patients hospitalized for COPD flare-up die within a year. Dr. David Menino is a respiratory medical expert at GSK. It is important to act before COPD progresses. Flare-ups should be treated early on before the condition worsens. Having one COPD flare-up increases the risk of having another, and studies have shown each flare-up can cause more lung damage. You don't have to settle with symptoms that interfere with your daily routine. If you continue to experience COPD symptoms, speak with your doctor about what more can be done to manage them. Dr. Menino says studies demonstrate that early treatment brings improvement in lung function, breathlessness, and quality of life. Find out more at COPD.com. It's National Alzheimer's Disease Awareness Month, as well as National Family Caregivers Month. The two go together since there are more than 16 million families and friends in the U.S. caring for someone with Alzheimer's. According to the Alzheimer's Association, four out of five caregivers say they'd like more support in providing care, especially from their families, yet 39% haven't engaged others in caregiving tasks. Ruth Drew, Director of Information and Support Services for the Alzheimer's Association, has suggestions on ways to help. Make a standing appointment to give the caregiver a break so they can run errands or go to a support group. Caregivers often feel isolated or alone, so check in with a phone call or stop by for a visit. And when you offer support, be specific. Say, I'm going to the store, what do you need, rather than call me if you need anything. People overwhelmingly agree caregiving for someone with Alzheimer's should be a group effort. Find more tips and resources for caregivers at alz.org. Flu vaccinations are proven to prevent serious illness and reduce the risk of death from the flu in people with heart disease. Yet a new study shows nearly a third of adults with heart disease skip annual flu shots. 
The study, presented at the American Heart Association Scientific Sessions 2019, finds that 65% of uninsured low-income patients go unvaccinated. And even among those with insurance and a regular source of medical care, nearly 30% hadn't been vaccinated. Dr. Gautam Ramaharsha Grandi of MedStar Health in Baltimore is the lead study author. People with heart disease are at higher risk of medical complications and death from the flu. And an annual flu vaccination is inexpensive, easy, and proven to be effective. With the flu season upon us, we urge adults with heart disease to get their flu shot. The annual flu vaccine is protective, and it can significantly reduce the risks of serious illnesses. The American Heart Association recommends all adults with heart disease to consult with your doctor to get a flu vaccine. Thank you for listening to Viewpoints Radio, a production of Media Tracks Communications. If you enjoyed this broadcast, please support our show by subscribing, sharing it with a friend, and leaving a review on Apple Podcasts. You can find more Viewpoints stories on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Spotify, and ViewpointsOnline.net. Also, follow us on Instagram and Twitter at Viewpoints Radio. Coming up next week... Identity theft is a crime where you are presumed guilty until you can prove yourself innocent. The lifelong burden of one family's secrets. Then... Probably couldn't have got through college, much less medical school if it wasn't for music. We speak with two doctors who turned their love for music into a second career. I'm Marty Peterson. And I'm Gary Price. These stories in-depth on your public affairs magazine, Viewpoints.